everybody and welcome back to another video in our series of companion guides to the eye of the world. This series is for those that are reading the books for the first time, but we will also have a small spoiler section at the end of the video for those who are rereading the books and want to go a bit deeper on the material. Make sure to check out the previous videos in this series and all of those videos will have an accompanying written guide with access to all of the maps on thegreatblight.com. Today we'll be tackling chapter 6 of Eye of the World, titled The Westwood. Now all the videos in this series are broken down into two sections, with the first section being a basic recap of the chapter. There will be visuals and additional maps that will help you understand basically what you just read. Sometimes it's just helpful to have visuals to accompany what you're reading. The section is safe for first time readers and will not spoil anything past that particular chapter in the books. It is designed with first time readers in mind. The second section of the video will be spoiler filled and will have not only a breakdown of what happened in the chapter, but it will get to all of the foreshadowing to future books, Easter eggs to our time, general thoughts and things like that. This section is designed for folks that are rereading the series. Now this entire video series is sponsored by audible.com. Audible is the world's largest provider of audiobooks and the wheel of time audiobooks are outstanding. It is my favorite way to reread the series. Audible is offering a free audiobook to all of my viewers. All you have to do is head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash nameless and get the free trial for the service. You can keep the book even if you don't want to keep the service and you really support the channel by doing so. Again, www.audibletrial.com forward slash nameless or you can follow the link in the description of the video. So let's go ahead and recap chapter six of Eye of the World titled The Westwood. Now the chapter opens with Rand preparing to take Tam back to Emmons Field. He has fashioned a litter from the cart in the previous chapter and he's using blankets to kind of make a litter out of this old cart with blankets to pull Tam along. He moves through the forest near the quarry road, worried that if he gets too far away from the road, he's not gonna be able to find his way, but also worried that if he goes on the road, the Trollocs and Murdral are gonna find him. So as he moves through the woods, Tam's condition worsens and he starts having fever dreams, spouting off memories of wars and even an event he calls the blood snow. Meanwhile, Rand tries to avoid any notice, telling Tam to keep quiet. Rand can feel evil and even notices a number of Trollocs and Murdral moving west down the road. Rand successfully avoids them while in the woods, but he is scared. Tam continues to have dreams and Rand brings him closer and closer to what he hopes is the safety of Emmons Field. Tam begins to talk about Layman's Sin, something that Rand isn't familiar with. He talks of a Vendazora and a Vendaloradera. These are trees that Rand has heard of and he wonders if creatures like the Green Man and the Ogier may be real given that Trollocs are real. Then Tam mutters something else that almost stops Rand in his tracks. He says, in remembrance of an event long past, that Carrie would be so happy if he brings back the boy that he found on the side of the mountain, and then he says, Rand is a good name. Suddenly, Rand is unsure of who he is and who Tam is, and then the chapter ends. So that's the recap of chapter six of Eye of the World. We are now going to jump into the spoiler section. The rest of this video will carry a spoiler rating of red, with major spoilers running all the way through the final book in the series, A Memory of Light. If you have not finished all of the books of the series, go do that and come back and then watch this. So let's go ahead and start with foreshadowing. When Rand is first starting to move Tam on the litter, he dresses Tam's wound. He makes the comment in his own thoughts that the wound is only the size of his hand and not deep at all. Truly just a flesh wound. It's just a flesh wound. And he's not sure why Tam has the fever that he does. He's even seen Tam take a worse wound and keep working. This is foreshadowing to tell us that not only is there something more to this wound, but it speaks to the danger of shadow spawn in general. Later, when Tam is having his fever dreams, he mentions the Aiel coming over the Dragon Wall and the Blood Snow. Now these are references to the Aiel War and we later find out that Tam fought for the Ilyanar Companions and fought in the Aiel Wars. Additionally, these were important events in the story, especially being that Rand was discovered by Tam on Dragon Mount. Now one thing that is very easy to not notice is Rand feeling the Trollocs and Murdral before he sees them. He describes it as grit scraping his bones and he seemingly feels the shadow spawn coming before he sees them. This is the second time Rand seems to be able to feel them, and this is evidence that he can channel, as channelers can feel shadow spawn when they're near. Another thing about this is that the shadow spawn were coming from, from the east and moving west. 
So in other words, they were coming from the direction of Emmons Field. This foreshadows the destruction that happened there, which ties in also with Rand having thoughts that Emmons Field would be safe and that they would be just celebrating there and having Beltine festivals. He paints such a rosy picture of everything at Beltine and in Emmons Field and being so relaxing, this is obviously setting us up for Rand to be completely let down when they arrive and find the town half destroyed and that it wasn't spared either. Tam also begins talking about Avenstora, which is the fabled tree of life that is said to be at the home of the Green Man. Now this gets Rand thinking about the Green Man and Ogier, and he initially just thinks they're just myths, but after seeing a Trollic in a Murdral, he thinks to himself that they might be real also. And of course, he's right. He will meet both an Ogier and Loyal, and he will meet the Green Man himself by the end of the book. Again, foreshadowing for those things that happen much later. Robert Jordan is just setting it up right here. Now, let's hit some general thoughts as this is one of the shorter chapters in the book. First, Tam talks about the Aiel War during his fever dreams and gives some pretty cool backstory in the history of the Aiel coming over the Dragon Wall and how the nations of the Westlands completely underestimated the Aiel. I love this stuff and the level of world building is actually what drew me into the series. Robert Jordan does this in the first couple chapters. We'll get to a couple of these where he uses these stories of the past to sort of set up the world building. We get a story from Tam here. We got another story from Tam in the Ravens prologue. We're about to get some stories from Tom, from Moraine. Again, it's really setting up that world building and it's one of the things I loved. Now it's also interesting to note here the level of care that Rand has for Tam. He is desperate to get Tam to safety and overcomes quite a bit of fear uh, to try to save his father. Now later in The Gathering Storm, there is such a contrast there because he almost kills his dad with Balefire. Scenes like this one with Rand moving through the Westwood, dragging his father on a makeshift litter while he's exhausted and starving, they all show how Rand's madness actually progressed later in the series because we know the starting point and we know how flippin' crazy Rand ends up. Now the last thing I noticed reading this is that Rand shows a character trait here that he will continue to show throughout the story. Rand tends to deal with reality by shoving it aside and pretending it doesn't exist and by avoiding it. For example, here he denies that Tam could possibly be his father despite hearing it out of his mouth and internally knowing it's true by just repeating that Tam is my father, Tam is my father. You know, later when it's fairly clear that he is the Dragon Reborn, he denies this as well and pretends it isn't true. He will do the same thing about being a noble, about dealing with the Black Tower later in the story. It's just something that's a part of his characterization and you can see that here. He deals with things that he doesn't want to believe by choosing not to believe them. What are your thoughts on the Westwood? Is there any foreshadowing I missed or any observations you had? Please let me know in the comments of the video and make sure to stay tuned for other videos like this in this series. We will be going through every chapter of Eye of the World and eventually we'll hit the other books as well. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time content. That's all I do here. And remember to get your free audiobook at audibletrial.com forward slash nameless. Thanks for watching, everybody, and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free crying. Tinker, oh dear, Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?